Hello, everyone. I'm Stephen Abrams, head of the Digital Preservation Program at the Harvard Library. I'd like to start off today by offering a huge thank you to the NDSA. I really appreciate the generous recognition represented by this award. Looking through the list of current and past winners, it's extremely gratifying to be included uh, alongside such august company. Given the nature of my individual award, I'd like to take this opportunity to offer some uh, somewhat idiosyncratic individual uh, comments on a topic that's uh, been taking up a bit of my attention lately. This has been motivated by two questions. One, uh, that I, and I suspect uh, many, if not all of you, um, get asked all the time. And another, that um, I'm afraid we aren't asked enough, and uh, I think it's certainly true we are not answering enough. So let's look into these two. So what is digital preservation anyhow? I'm sure uh, all of you have a good sense uh, in your own minds of what constitutes this field of endeavor. And we can certainly look at sort of the uh, weighted terminological commonalities found across a number of well-known definitions as shown here. These certainly all seem to be extremely pertinent concepts to the field. On the other hand, uh, we could be uh, rather modern about it and rely on a generative answer for a synthetic summary of the literature. Well, this is perhaps not so bad for a chatbot, um, but I think um, we as humans can actually do a little bit better. I find that this definition's emphasis on a single technological risk vector is um, a bit overly simplistic. And while the uh, articulation of uh, a binary complementarity between access and use is uh, a very important component of what it is that we do, I think it's uh, not quite as expansive as it should be. I would suggest instead a trinary set of primary concerns. And I'm happy to say uh, that that is in fact what we get from the NDSA's vision statement included as the preamble to the 2020 agenda, which talks respectively about value, availability, and use. Uh, and in fact, um, we get a very important qualifier sort of thrown in here for free. I'll come back to that in a moment. These three archival concerns, value, excess, and use, um, to me, imply three corresponding preservation imperatives. Historically, we have concentrated mostly on that first artifactual concern surrounding objects. Some of you may recall that that other conference, IPRES, was for the first 10 years of its existence, the International Conference on Preservation of Digital Objects. So I was making that actually quite explicit. I'm glad to say that over the last nine years, uh, the name of the conference series uh, has been genericized. Now, that second behavioral concern is uh, now getting a lot of um, uh, uh, traction, particularly in terms of efforts surrounding software preservation and emulation, all to the good. But that third experiential concern has not yet, in my opinion, received the full level of attention that it merits. Now, in part, that might be because it undoubtedly will be difficult to wrestle with, but nevertheless. Uh, now, <clears throat> a bit more about that qualifier I mentioned. <clears throat> Very pointedly, uh, the vision talks about reuse and not just use. Uh, and I think that makes all of a difference because it emphasizes that use is not reductively prescriptive, but rather inclusively descriptive. It is not singular, but multifarious. It is not susceptible solely to objective consideration but also requires cognizance of the inherent intersubjectivity of purposive intention and expectation surrounding use. 
Well, now that we've all too quickly <clears throat> gotten a better handle on what it is that we are or should be doing, on to the second question, the pesky one. How well are we doing it? Now, happily, uh, we do have recourse to um, a fairly robust uh, number of maturity models, certification instruments, and the like that provide us with a good benchmark for our capacity to do things to things. But while we perhaps have ways to measure those things as outputs of preservation activity, we really don't have a sufficient handle on the importance of the outcomes of doing those things. What is the import of our activities? In the words of uh, Claire Kreiser, we've gotten pretty good at measuring our managerial busyness, uh, but not necessarily the experiential efficacy resulting from that busyness. Now, this is important because that human-centered efficacy lies, I think, at the heart of the stewardship enterprise. Over 170 years ago, uh, with the founding of the Boston Public Library, was announced by a statement that promoted the fact that the information stewarded or intended to be stewarded by the library at that point was it's great as the great medium of communication between mind and mind as respects different individuals, countries, and periods of time. Notice this absolute uh, emphasis on the fact that there's people at either end of the information business. I would similarly argue that digital preservation is not just a techno managerial exercise, but rather a fundamentally communicative one, connecting future encounters and human exploitation of past informative expression that just happens to unfold across archival time spans and technical as well as cultural distance. Extending our conceptual perspective in this manner uh, necessitates an accompanying expansion of the scope of preservation assessment as well. Our current evaluative focus on trustworthiness is only telling us half the story. We need to complement our characterization of enabling preservation management with that of enabled preservation experience. To me, this suggests a research agenda into actionable metrics um, that need to span at least seven pertinent aspects of the preservation affordance and experience. The integrity of physical manifestation, it's to say bits on some sort of storage media, the validity of empiric encoding, just say um, you know, authoritative uh, file formats, the authenticity of syntactic expression, is the thing expressed what it purports to be? The reliability of semantic meaning, does it actually comport with the truth? the accessibility of performing behavior. Can I get to it? Can I do something reasonable with it? Can I navigate it? Can I experience it? The relevancy of playistic context, how does this fit in to uh, my, uh, my particular uh, con contingent purpose? And then finally, the ultimate goal of preservation activity, the legitimacy of pragmatic understanding of preserved digital information. Now, some of these things we already know how to deal with, primarily those uh, on the upper half of this list. Others, not so much. But we shouldn't shy away from what might seem to us now to be a fairly wicked problem. Instead, we should uh, view this as both a grand challenge and a grand opportunity. Why is that so important? Well, simply, without effective ways of quantifying and qualifying what it is that we do, and more importantly, what does it mean of what we do, we won't be capable of fully addressing our responsibilities professionally and competently, which would be a disservice to our communities of service both today and tomorrow. I hope uh, that some of these ideas resonate with you. 
If so, here are pointers to a couple of recent publications in which I'm able to go into a lot more detail about some of these issues. Nevertheless, I'd really appreciate hearing any comments and questions you might have about this. With that, I thank you. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of the Digital Press recap. Goodbye. All right, I think the recording is working well. Hello, everyone. My name is Sophia van Hoek. I am a senior staff member of the acquisition team at the National Archives of the Netherlands. I work with government archives, both paper and digital. And today I am going to talk about sustainability, which is also something I am active in. Uh, as some of you may know, I received the 2023 Future Stewards Excellence Award last year at DigiPress, which is uh, something I'm incredibly grateful for. So thank you once again to the NDCA. And today I was given the opportunity to talk a bit more about my journey in this field and what had led me to receive this award. So on that note, let's get started. So my journey in the sustainability field started in January of last year when I started an internship at the digital preservation team of the National Archives uh, of the Netherlands. I was still a student at the time, uh, specializing in archives and cultural heritage in Amsterdam, and I was looking for a thesis subject. Uh, and that is when I came across the uh, sustainability work group of the National Archives, and they had done a research uh, which uh, gave numbers of the uh, impact of the organization on every part of it, right? So you can think of travel, you can think of food, also energy use uh, in, for example, the heating in the building, and also in the category data storage and IT, which includes digital archives and preservation. And what really shocked me, well, pretty much shocked everyone, um, was how big the impact of data storage and IT was on the organization. So data storage and IT, one <laughs> very negative context <laughs> with over 90% of the total impact uh, of CO2. So for reference, the total impact of the organization is about 3,879 tons of CO2 equivalent. And that is equivalent to uh, 96,975 mature trees absorbing CO2 for a year. And that amount of mature trees is equivalent to a forest the size of 291 soccer fields. And all those extra emissions in the atmosphere um, contribute to the rise of global temperature. And from that total impact, about 90% and currently even more is just from digital archives, which is very alarming. Um, especially because at the time we were not yet aware of the impact of digital archives on the environment in the Netherlands. Uh, the worst part of it all is that we relatively don't have that many digital archives yet uh, compared to paper archives, but the amount of digital archives is really steadily rising. Um, I found this quote by an American archivist, which is a great illustration of the shock we experienced uh, because of this research. So she writes, it is ironic that digitization was supposed to make us greener, more sustainable from the perspective of infrastructure, budget, and the environment. But the fact is, our current digital preservation strategies rely heavily on server farms and cloud storage. We did not see this one coming. I think this really illustrates uh, the shock that we all felt. Uh, so while doing more research, I realized that not only was there a lack of um, awareness, but also a lack of solutions. And the solutions that we already know are in direct conflict with the mission of the National Archives. So, for example, keeping less archives or digitizing less. Uh, and they also came with huge questions. Um, this really worried me because I really believe that we need to act as quick as possible. Uh, we still have the time to really think about decisions we are making when it comes to digital archives. Now that the amount uh, that is coming to us is still relatively small. Um, but we really need to be prepared. So one thing we can already find practical solutions in that could be implemented a lot quicker is digital preservation. And that realization brought me to my thesis subject. So my thesis is called Walking a Tightrope Across the Gap of uh, Digital Preservation and Environment Sustainability. And that walking a tightrope across the gap symbolizes that we need to find balance between the two. 
um, how do we responsibly reduce the impact of digital archives on the environment without sacrificing digital preservation and thus the digital sustainability of the archives themselves? That is really just my message uh, with my thesis. So my research consists of four sub-questions, and the first question is about prioritization of the activities that I will tackle my thesis. As I only had five short months to work on it, so I really want to be strategic, strategic, sorry, strategic <laughs> uh, in what activities will be best to start with. Uh, this part of my research has also been documented very well in my thesis, and it might help the reader by giving an example of how to strategically find uh, activities that research uh, to research and to spend precious time and resources on. So I found about three activities that will be uh, perfect for me to tackle my research. And the first one is about the ecological cost of emulation as compared to file format migration. So between those two, which methods is more environmentally sustainable? Uh, emulation is something the digital preservation team at the National Archives is heavily looking into as something to apply more in the digital preservation methods. And to answer this question, I relied mostly on already existing literature that's compared the two access strategies. Um, it is difficult to exactly measure what the exact impact on the environment is of both of these methods, especially because emulation has not been uh, broadly implemented in the organization yet. Um, but with that literature, literature review, um, we could base arguments uh, on efficiency, how error prone both methods are, methods are and data storage. And that led me to the conclusion that there are a lot of arguments to be made in favor of emulation. Um, and this result also illustrates well that sustainability is very connected to other important considerations that we have to make when choosing a strategy in digital preservation. Um, so once again, it's about balance, uh, and I believe that sustainability should, should be one of the considerations, but not the only one or the, or the ultimate one. So second um, is a test of the energy use and the data storage of the tools C3PO and Niflheim. Um, and those are preservation tools that can be used during impact assessments for uh, identification and validation. And this activity that I research contains a very straightforward and simple method to compare those two preservation software tools um, using a watt hour meter that I plugged into my computer, a uh, test data set, and comparing the results um, so in a spreadsheet and the data storage of those spreadsheets. Um, I really noticed how. At the time of doing my research, there were many accessible ways of comparing such tools based on energy use. So I really came up with my own method for it. Uh, and I, I would like to think that it was pretty successful. Um, the result was that C3PO used way more energy because it included a lot more search text. So it had to run longer um, and looked for more information in the test data set, which made it so that it used more energy. And that also meant that CGPO's results, which came in the form of a spreadsheet, use a lot more data storage than Niflheim. Once again, it contains more information. Um, which is why Niflheim uh, won on energy uh, use, uh, data storage and efficiency, um, because it gave only the necessary information. Um, and with that became really the clear winner. Uh, this was also a great way to test the what kind of technical capabilities we needed and what kind of information we needed from such tools uh, in our digital preservation strategies. So last but not least is a method based on the incredible uh, research and article by Pondergrass called Toward Environmentally Sustainable Digital Preservation, uh, which it took a lot of inspiration from. And this article uh, tells us how an organization can improve uh, their digital preservation based on sustainability. And one of the activities that uh, Pendergrass gave um, um, uh, a guide for is fixie checking. So it asks four questions that an or organization should ask itself, such as how often do you run scheduled fixie checks and how do you run those checks during peak or uh, off-peak energy and network hours? 
and this uh, this research really helped getting grip on the process of fixie checking as a whole, uh, but also really on sustainability. And by asking those questions to the relevant experts in the organization, I feel like we really found uh, many chances for improvement in this process. Um, so this was an incredibly short summary of my thesis <laughs> and the research <laughs> that I've done for it. Um, so I would like to uh, let you all know that if you would like to know more, please read the thesis itself. It is not that long and I really try to write it in very accessible language with a lot of explanation. Um, it is meant to be an example of practical solutions that can be quickly uh, implemented and also uh, hopefully help you shift your mindset on the subject of sustainability. I would also like to mention that my thesis includes a short manifest on the subject and a step-by-step -step overview of the methods in my research. And um, ever since re finishing my research, uh, my thesis and my research, I have continued to be active in the sustainability world. I often give presentations or workshops in the Netherlands, as well as actively advocating for the subject and raising awareness, especially in my own organization. Um, but of course, I cannot do this alone, so I, I get the help of uh, the members of the Green IT Expert Group uh, from the Network Digital uh, Heritage in the Netherlands. And next to the things I mentioned before, we also organize uh, public events and create educational products on the subject. Uh, I also hope to actively contribute more to the international field this year. Um, and yeah, on that note, I have reached the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you all for listening. And thank you again to the NCA for the opportunity. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. My contact information is on the slide before you. Um, or if you just want to connect with me, I'd really appreciate that. So thank you so much for listening. Hi, getting uh, set up here. So I'm going to share my screen. Do -do -do -do. Which one do we want? We want this one. Uh, all right, we should be sharing um, into a eternal infinity mirror, and now you should be able to see my screen. Oh, let me back up just a little bit. Here's my talk. Um, doing learning teaching, just came up with that on the fly. Uh, wasn't sure what to call this. Hi, um, I'm Ashley. Uh, first of all, thanks for taking time out of your day to listen to me give a talk. Uh, also, second, thank you so much to the National Digital Stewardship Alliance for giving me an award this year and for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so really sorry I couldn't have been there in person in St. Louis um, to see so many of my beloved colleagues, um, but glad we could convene a bit here online at this time, even though this talk is pre-recorded. Um, so this is my working title, Charts. That's why I was like, what am I going to call this? Charts, chart, charts. Um, but uh, Here's my website. Here's all the stuff I have done and I currently do. So that'll serve as an introduction to me. Uh, first, I want to talk about some educational projects that I've worked on in the past. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about a recent project and um, go into my thinking there and how I think about digital preservation and hashtag glam and uh, education in those fields at a larger level. Let's do that. Um, I've worked on a lot of projects over the past decade plus uh, that I've been in this career. Um, here are a few of those. We have the AV Artifact Atlas, uh, which uh, helps people identify errors with analog video software and figure out what to do with them. Um, it was a big part of the redesign of this project, uh, making it easier for people to contribute. Uh, this is the Halt and Catch Fire syllabus, which is a way of sort of exploring like uh, non-academic syllabi so people can sort of form their own um, sort of clubs and, and continued education around um, 
the history of technology through the lens of a television series. Um, and then the collection management system collection, which is uh, one of the most popular things that I've done. It gets shared around quite a lot and it's just a very big list of what are the different factors that go into selecting a collection management system. Um, and that's a collaborative project. A lot of people have contributed to that resource. I thank them very much. Um, a few more. Um, I have a couple of validators that I've created on the web for people that need uh, support with that. Um, FF Improviser is, as it says on the screen, making FFmpeg easier. It's a toolkit especially for archivists to have examples of scripts that they can sort of copy and paste and then sort of understand what all of those bits and pieces are actually doing um, when they're trying to get to their goal, like make a GIF or something like that. Um, another one here is media info parameter definitions. Um, media info is, oh, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting an emergency alert. So I'm going to pause this briefly and pick it up in just a moment when it's complete. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. We have been having a lot of flood warnings and it comes through a system that I can't disable in my house. Um, but always good to be, um, aware. Uh, Media info parameter definitions. Uh, this helps people look up the definition of um, sort of the results that you get on the screen. So it's a little educational boost. Um, I had it, I, this is part of a larger project that I did in sort of writing the documentation for those parameters, um, which was a several month long project that I took on. And then this is sort of a way to display that so people could look it up uh, more directly. So they actually know what um, what the results they're getting back are. They can do a little more uh, investigation into that. Um, one more, it's uh, Illustrated Media Format Guides. I published a couple books in the past couple years um, on this topic, but the data and the illustrations are available online too, as well as some trivia. So that, that's a little educational angle that I thought was really fun. So people could try to um, guess what um, format uh, is the question and then uh, flip it over to reveal the answer and learn more about that format. Um, all right. Uh, also as a bonus, I have a just training site that I made a few years ago that I is quite useful. I uh, reuse it often enough to base some guest lectures um, I do off of them. And I've heard a lot of people use them as independent study. There's a lot of different uh, categories here and um, Contributions are always uh, welcome for things that may have gotten outdated in the past couple of years. Um, but for this talk, I, it means I need to scope my projects down a bit. Uh, so I want to talk about a few of the projects I've done that involve charts. Um, as this recent project I'll talk about also focuses on and around charts. Um, so I want to mention at this point that I do have a degree in graphic design. Uh, but I, I don't use it. I'm, I'm terrible. I'm not a very good visual designer. So while having for the eye for design helps, um, it's not the important, most important part of data visualization. That's uh, where the information scientist hat plays the most important role. So I don't want that lack of confidence to hinder anyone from trying. Um, make it ugly first, fix it up later. Um, that goes for code too. Make it ugly first, fix it up later, or don't fix it up later. <laughs> it's up to you. Um, so I've tackled a few charts and insights based projects over my career, some of them outside the library's field, some of them from work, um, a few of them that fit into this DigiPrez realm. Um, so on the previous screen was QC Tools, which is uh, charts based, but it's a little bit ugly. Um, on this screen is a media collection viewer, which uh, is a fun little project I did mostly to learn uh, Rust, the programming language and WebAssembly. And uh, it takes a JSON output of uh, your collection and it visualizes it for you. So you can sort of know what kind of video codecs you have, what's the color space, are there any things that don't quite fit in that shouldn't. You could see this um, at this larger scale. Um, and this recent project had an educational bent to it as well. Uh, the educational component starting first with me. Uh, a lot of my projects start this way uh, because what influences me to come up with an idea is seeing a gap in my own education, my own knowledge, and trying to motivate myself to fill that gap. And uh, the best way to motivate me is to do something creative and fun rather than something like rote memorization. Um, so despite being uh, both a librarian and a software developer for over a decade, uh, my greatest weakness is that I'm not very good at SQL. 
Um, yes, this, this talk is all about me self-deprecating. That's the last one. I'm sorry. Um, I thought it would be, given my background, that SQL would be something that I'm really great at. And then I just, like, wasn't at all. There's something, like, we all have our strengths. Like, SQL is just something that didn't click with me very well in my head. And I always struggle with uh, writing it or even just coming up with uh, how I should be thinking about it, right? Maybe because it looks so simple, like, deceptively simple, or I have, like, a different understanding of, of relationship um, databases. I don't know. Um, so I didn't take it as a serious threat, but it is. Um, anyway, this project uh, started with me refreshing my Python knowledge, first of all, um, and also having to write actual SQL queries instead of leveraging abstractions that sort of let me do the same thing without going straight into SQL. Um, this project has me exploring a data set provided to all of us from the Library of Congress. Uh, I happen to be working with this website quite a lot over the past several months on a contract, but this project isn't related to that work at all. This was just for fun. Just for fun, I probably need a legal disclaimer here. Uh, this is for fun only. Uh, there's no lobbying, bribing, coercion, or any of the other things that uh, government employees outside of uh, other elected officials have to worry about. Uh, anyway, uh, this is the set of sustainability of digital formats website. Uh, which is a great resource. I always want to hype it up. Um, it's very dense. It's thoroughly researched. Um, that is a humble brag to make up for my previous self-deprecation because I have been doing that research. Um, it's a very great website with a lot of detailed information of over 500 formats. Um, but the thing about this data is it's mostly thought about in terms of each individual page, as you see here on the screen, um, which represents a format. And there are hyperlinks to other formats. There's resources on the web but mostly it's thought about in this way as a page. Um, and I wanted to think about it at a level higher than that because I wanted to know what the entire collection looked like. So how many formats were AV versus how many formats were text-based? How many relationships does PDF page has? It's quite a lot. <laughs> um, and what formats are categorized as binary versus ones that are categorized as text? What even is a format? Um, P.S. I do have a project launching on that topic uh, later this year. Stay tuned on that. Um, so I did that. Wham, bam. Here it is. This is what it looks like. Nice. Uh, wait, uh, wait, kind of boring. Um, okay. Here's what it actually looks like when you click beyond the home page, um, which was set up by default. Charts. Charts. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this tool is based on data set. Data set which uh, gives us this friendly web-based uh, interface to a database. Um, so through this, I was able to make some charts, and then some of these charts can be used to educate others. Um, they give some insight into things we didn't really know before about these documents as a collection instead of just as individual resources. Um, before I could spin all this up with data set, I had to, okay, um, close your ears if you don't want to hear uh, techno babble for just a moment. Um, I promise it'll be quick, just mentally fast forward 15 seconds or something. Um, first I had to download the collection from a website, write a Python script that would parse the XML of each format and relay that into a SQL database structure that mapped in a way that made the most sense and was also easiest for me at the time because my patience has limits. Um, the SQL is gnarly, but it works. Um, from then I was able to pop that into a data set installation, which was very, very, very easy. Um, and then uh, add this dashboard plugin and voila, it was good to go. The deploying was easy until it wasn't, but that's a bit out of scope for this talk. Um, everything works locally uh, fine anyway, and um, I ran into those really weird things that had nothing to do with application or my dev DevOps knowledge, which I promise is extremely vast, and that's my second humble brag, and so now we're back up to even in terms of deprecating versus bragging up in this talk. Um, so I just tried a different method, and that worked like a breeze. Um, so I think it shouldn't be hard for anyone to replicate these actions or get their own data set running locally or on the web. Um, okay, you can open your ears if you had them closed. Let's go. Um, but unlike my previous charting projects, this one helps those interested in performing their own queries and editing it. Uh, Dataset's really great for this. And um, the charts are this like fun part because the data is now structured in a way that instead of individual XML files, people can use it uh, as a way to form their own questions in the data and get their own answers. Uh, just by doing a little click, click, right, right, click, click. 
Um, and then some of this. Um, if people would just want to only do clicking and not do any typing, there's like drag and drop menus where you could say, okay, well, I want to know when the draft status was not full and sort them by ID, whatever, um, to be able to get that list back. Um, so as an aside, uh, here it is. This is the URL. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you play around with it. Uh, you can also see my GitHub or my blog um, or this URL for links to more. Um, overall, I hope this encourages you to find new ways of exploring uh, how to do things and also help others along the way uh, learn with you. Uh, so thanks for listening to me. Thanks for NDSA for having me. That's it from Ashley of the past. Ashley of the future, aka Ashley of the present, um, will be here and around for questions. Hello, my name is Michelle Donoghue and I work for the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority in the UK. I'm also one of the team of happy recipients of the NDSA Excellence Award for our project, Reliable, Robust and Resilient Digital Infrastructure for Nuclear Decommissioning. I'm going to talk to you today about our project, and so I'll be explaining who the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority are to provide you with some context, why digital preservation is so important to delivering our mission, who we worked with on this project, a brief summary of what we achieved, and what difference this has made to our work. So who are we? Well, the NDA is a non-departmental government organisation, so referred to here in the UK as a public body. The NDA itself is quite small with 350 people, but we work within a wider group of, of organisations called the NDA Group, who consist of site licence companies and subsidiary organisations. So together, we're about 17,000 people. The NDA have a clear mission, which is to clean up the UK's earliest nuclear sites safely, securely and cost effectively. And whilst doing so, ensuring we care for people, communities and the environment. But it's not an easy job. The UK's nuclear landscape started to take shape in the 1940s and has evolved over many decades. We have 17 sites currently which is expected to increase and these sites include the first fleet of nuclear power stations, research centres, fuel related facilities and cellar field which has the largest radioactive inventory and the most complex facilities to decommission. Our current plans indicate it's going to take more than 100 years to deliver the mission. In the future nuclear waste will be held in a geological disposal facility or GDF and possibly at other locations too. And this will be held for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So we need to prepare for this. And it's incumbent on us to make sure that future generations have a record of all of our activity. As well as processing and managing the existing legacy records, we also have new paper and digital records being created all the time. To help manage these records, and as sites are constantly changing and evolving whilst they're being decommissioned, We've built an archive in the far north of Scotland. Nucleus, the Nuclear and Caithness Archive, has place of deposit status and lots of other accreditations and is managed through a commercial partner agreement um, with a company called Restore Digital. It's also home to the North Highland Archive Collection, managed by High Life Highland, and about 60 people work on this site. It is a public building and we regularly get visitors. Digitisation and information management projects are also delivered on other sites on a hub and spokes kind of model, and they also involve more than 60 people. So with a huge legacy of records and new ones being created all the time and the need to keep them for hundreds, possibly even thousands of years, we've identified a need to focus our approach on digital preservation and we established this project to ensure we have the right advice, guidance and policies that are going to help us to access and secure the critical legacy data and systems, adapt our current data and systems to ensure long term viability and commission future data and systems as well with long term resilience from the outset. We're also taking the opportunity to work within the Digital Preservation Coalition's wider membership so we can share our challenges and our outputs. The project was a partnership between myself and members of my team in the NDA and from the archive, 
representatives from our site operating companies, specifically for some of this works and uh, Magnox and Sellafield, and importantly, the Digital Preservation Coalition. The DPC are a charity and a member organisation with over 150 members across the world. This has been enormously helpful in this work, as they've not only had the fantastic staff of experts with knowledge and experience that we needed, but also access into that wider membership whom we were able to share and validate our approaches. So what did we do? Well, we created a maturity modelling tool called the Rapid Assessment Model, or the RAM. We developed a digital preservation skills and competencies kit called the CAT. We explored IT system requirements, creating procurement toolkits, guidance on preserving different types of digital content, and many other things too. I'm just going to talk through a couple of the outputs. So our rapid assessment model, known as the RAM, is a maturity model for digital preservation. It allows you to understand where you are and where you'd like to be, and allows for benchmarking against others. It's pretty quick and easy to carry out a self-assessment, and the resources are now available in Dutch, Spanish, French, Italian, Portuguese, Japanese, Chinese, and Turkish. So it's pretty widely available to people. We've used it uh, within the NDA very successfully taking a workshop approach to allow us to be able to discuss where potentially we've got gaps and identify those areas for improvement. By repeatedly taking the model on a year or every two year basis, we're able to see what our progression has been and know where to focus our resources for the future. Another output of the project has been the competency Competency Audit Toolkit, known as the TPC CAT. This is an assessment of the skills for carrying out digital preservation. You can use it to find out if the skills exist within your organisation or team, or whether there's a need for training or further recruitment to ensure that digital preservation work can take place effectively. Again, we've found this tool particularly helpful to ensure that my team have the competencies they require, but also working with other functions who link into digital preservation. So our IT colleagues, security colleagues, and our archive team more widely. A series of different technology watch publications have also been um, created, and they include topics such as preserving born digital records, preserving geospatial data, and preserving other data types too. So in conclusion, throughout the course of this project, we've increased our confidence in our approach. We've upskilled our teams, benefited from improving our processes, and we've managed to make friends along the way. All the resources are available from the Digital Preservation Coalition website, but here I've left a link to the specifics. Please feel free to access them. One of the benefits of this project has been it not only has enhanced the work that we do in nuclear decommissioning, but has also been beneficial to a number of other organisations right across the membership of the Digital Preservation Coalition. So I encourage you to take a look. Thank you for your time.